A lot of people think that the spontaneous or completely natural life as it's understood by these Far Eastern philosophers is to act according to whim. There was, for example, a great Zen monk of uh, shortly after 1000 AD who had a very peculiar way of painting. He had long hair and he would certainly he'd get very drunk on uh, rice wine. Then he'd soak his hair in ink and slosh it all over the paper. Then he would do a Rorschach test on it <laughs> and decide what kind of a landscape it actually was <laughs> and then put in the finishing touches. <laughs> and suddenly, out of this apparent mess, a great landscape would be evoked. But the whole art of the thing lay in putting in the finishing touches. And also, there's a very curious thing. If a person who is untrained in painting <laughs> makes a mess with a brush, it's liable to be just a mess. Whereas if a person who has the feeling of painting in them for a long time, and they make a mess with a brush or just do anything, uh, it looks interesting. And that's why if you try uh, to copy the best uh, people in modern abstract non-objective painting, you'll find it a very difficult thing to do. Because there is more to spontaneity than caprice and disorder. And I want to try and explain what that is. I mean, wouldn't it be great if we could live <coughs> absolutely on the spur of the moment? Not make any uh, particular plans, not feel that... Uh, well, you might make plans because you could make plans spontaneously. But not to worry about whether you had made the right decision, whether you were being good or bad, selfish or unselfish, <laughs> and not to hesitate in anything, you see. Uh, in uh, one of the great applications of Zen, as I pointed out, was to the art of fencing. And when you learn fencing, you see you have to learn to be spontaneous. Because here of all places it is true that he who hesitates is lost. If you're engaged in combat, you see, and you stop to think what sort of a defense or attack you ought to make, the enemy has got you. So the way they teach people spontaneity in fencing is very interesting. When you start in to fencing school, you of course live with the teacher. He has a kind of ashram. And, but you're given a janitorial job. You clean up, you wash dishes, you put bedding away and things like that. But while you're going about your daily business, the master surprises you with a practice sword, which is made of four strips of bamboo, rather loosely tied together. And he hits you with this, surprisingly and suddenly, from nowhere. And you are expected to defend yourself with anything available with the bedding, with the broom, with the pots and pans, the, just anything, defend. But the poor student never knows when the attack is coming or where, what direction it's coming from. And he begins to get tense. He begins to go around everywhere on sort of alert, you see, watching, watching which direction it's coming from. And as he goes down a certain passage, feeling that the master is probably lurking around that corner, and he's all set to go for him as that, that he gets that practice sword, he suddenly gets hit from behind. <laughs> so eventually, he gives up. There's absolutely no way of preparing for the attack. And so he just wanders around and feeling, well, if it hits, it's going to hit me. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, he's ready to begin fencing. Because if you prepare for an attack from a, spe a specific direction, and it comes from some other direction, you have to withdraw from the direction in which you had expected it and send your energy in another direction, and that takes time. So what you do is, you go around with a mind of no expectation. That is called uh, mushin or munen. This is a very important Zen expression. Uh, mushin, it, it all means an empty mind. 
Uh, uh, you could also call it no heart, because the character Shin means both heart and mind, but it isn't quite the same as our word heartless, as we use it, and it isn't the same as the word mindless, as we use it, meaning stupid. To be in the state of Mushin is to have a mind like a mirror. And of this, uh, the Taoist sage Zhuangzi said, the perfect man employs his mind as a mirror. It grasps nothing, it refuses nothing, it receives but does not keep. And when uh, anything comes in front of the mirror, it reflects it instantly. The mirror doesn't wait to reflect it. They also say, when the moon rises, all bodies of water instantly reflect the moon. I mean, they, they, don't, they don't bother with physics about the speed of light or anything like that. Irrelevant. <laughs> or they say, when you clap your hands, the sound issues immediately. It doesn't can stop to consider whether it will issue. And so, sparks from the flint, when it's struck, they issue instantly. But to do this, you can't try to be quick. See, if a Zen master corners you with a funny situation, and he puts you in a quandary, expecting spontaneous action from you, don't try to hurry. I know I've watched Suzuki wait a whole minute before answering, but he doesn't hesitate. <laughs> <laughs> He's not at all embarrassed by this wait. And he can answer with silence just as well as with a formal response. The point is, do something. When uh, two young Americans wanted to study Zen, they uh, were taken by a Japanese monk to interview the master and act as interpreter. And one of them had had some practice, you know, he knew a bit about it. And so after they had tea together and just discussed formalities, the master said in a very easy way, well, what do you gentlemen know about Zen? And one of these students threw his fan, which he hadn't unfolded, the fan was still folded up, he threw it straight at the master's face. The master slightly moved to one side, and the fan went and went right through the paper wall. And the master laughed like a child. Huh? Well, that's the sort of game they get in. Once the master was uh, going around through the forest with a group of students, and he picked up a tree branch. You know, this is one might pick up a tree branch. And suddenly he turned to one of his students and said, what is it? And he hesitated, so he hit it with the branch. And so another student was there, and he turned to him and he said, what is it? He said, give it to me, I want to see it. I'll tell you. So the master tossed the branch to him, and he took it and hit the branch. <laughs> <laughs> now, you may think all this is kind of rough stuff. But let me give you another story, which is on a rather different level. A certain Zen priest was having dinner at a big party, and the party was being served by a geisha girl who was so elegant and so skillful in serving that he suspected she might have had some Zen training. And so he decided to try her out. And he nodded to her, and she immediately came to his place and sat down in front of his little low table. See, everybody was, would be seated, probably, in front of low tables all around the room, and the geisha servants and people move up and down in the middle. And so she came down and sat down in front of him and bowed, and he said, I would like to give you a present. And she said, I would be most honored. Now, on the table, there, is, there are hibachi, uh, which are uh, little braziers with hot charcoal in. And you move the charcoal around with iron chopsticks. He took a piece of charcoal out and iron chopsticks and offered it to her. She had long, long sleeves on her kimono, and what she did was this. She wound them all around her hands and took the charcoal. Immediately got up and went to the kitchen, disposed of the charcoal, changed her robe, which had holes turned all the way through the sleeves, and came back. And she sat down in front of the master and bowed. And, he said, and she said to him, I would like to give you a present. He said, I would be most honored. <laughs> and so she picked up the iron chopstick and handed him the charcoal. And he pulled out a cigarette 
Jason said, that's just what I wanted, and lit the cigarette. <laughs> <laughs> now, here's the lesson. The master's spontaneity and being ready for that situation was the kind of quick thinking that a good comedian has, who, in a completely unprepared way, can make all sorts of jokes and turn any situation into a jest of some kind. Uh, there are all sorts of people who do that. Uh, people who are experts in kind of like Dorothy Parker, in that sort of repartee. But here it's been developed in a, a very fundamental way and to a very high degree. Now, the, the way in which it's developed, you see, requires a protected situation. Be uh, because if we all started to act on the spur of the moment without the slightest consideration or deliberation, um, everybody would think we were crazy. And uh, people would avoid us and call the police and things like that. But what they do is this. They start you doing this in the context of a disciplined situation where there are very rigid rules for most of the time, but there are certain instances at which all those rules go hang. And you're in a community which understands the game. Because the point is this, when you start acting spontaneously, you're not used to doing it. And therefore your responses are unintelligent and inappropriate. But when you become used to doing this, and when it becomes second nature to you <coughs> to act in the state of motion, with no mind or no deliberation, then uh, uh, your behavior has matured and you find that you're accustomed to respond quite appropriately as the Zen master did in lighting his cigarette from the charcoal. <laughs> <laughs>